Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. You can be seated. This morning, it is my honor to reintroduce to you our speaker this morning, Dr. Al Mohler. Uh, you may remember last year he spoke this, around this time last year. Uh, an incredible message everyone uh, just raved about for weeks and weeks. And, and may, getting up and preaching after him, pretty difficult. But um, we, we are honored to have him back with us. For those of you that don't know Dr. Moeller, Dr. Moeller has been the president of Southern Baptist Theological Seminary for over 30 years. He just celebrated his 30 years there. He's also one of the leading voices and thinkers in the evangelical world. Just an incredible leader, uh, teacher, writer, speaker. Uh, he has a daily program called The Briefing, a podcast that addresses uh, news and events from a Christian worldview. So if you want to understand how to interpret things happening in the world through a Christian lenses and thinking about it Christianly, uh, he does a, a program every day that you should be listening to uh, on that front. Uh, more importantly than all of that, uh, he is an incredible husband, um, he's a father, he's a grandfather, and he's a leader in, uh, of men. He, he is a mentor to so many. Uh, if you have benefited any from this church, um, it is a large part from the extension of his ministry and his work at the seminary. Uh, the seminary met me, found me in a place in my life and my ministry a year into planting this church where I desperately needed training. I desperately needed encouragement. I desperately needed a vision for the church and for theology uh, that, would, that would propel me into being able to do this uh, long term and not fizzle out. And uh, the seminary met me in that place and I'm forever indebted uh, to it and for Dr. Moeller for leading so well. So if you would, would you join in welcoming to preach the word to us, Dr. Albert Moeller. Well, good morning. I greet you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is uh, wonderful to be here at Journey Church, wonderful to be here with you, uh, wonderful to be here on this Lord's Day uh, to witness baptism together, to share the Lord's table together, to confess the faith once for all delivered to the saints together, and now to turn to God's Word together as our focal passage is here in John chapter 20, as we have heard. It is a great joy to be here for me. I find a tremendous encouragement in this church. I find tremendous encouragement in your pastor. And I want to thank you for sharing him with the Southern Seminary and Boys College family last week when he came to preach uh, in Southern Seminary's chapel and uh, delivered the word and so effectively. I want to tell you a part of my joy in being here with, uh, with Pastor Eric and, uh, and with the team, is the team, and just seeing how the Lord has brought together an amazing group of men to teach and lead and pastor this church. And uh, I look out and I see you, and you are the visible evidence of God's promise and a gospel ministry. And uh, I'm just so thankful you are here, and it is my honor to be here with you. And uh, together for us to look to John chapter 20, and to consider Thomas. All right. Now, we just heard the word red. That's an important part of Christian worship, where you find Christians at worship. You should find song sung, gospel songs, and praise to God, and glory to Christ, and centered in the gospel. Where you find Christ's people in worship, 
You should find the ordinances, as we saw, of baptism and the Lord's table, the Lord's supper. You should find the affirmation of the faith, as we have shared together. But the culmination is actually in the preaching of the Word of God. It's not as if everything else is just preparatory, because there's no just. But they are preparatory. We come out of busy lives. We, uh, we, 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 we come on a Sunday morning, and uh, I mean, sometimes you have to negotiate traffic just to get here. And then you're in a growing, busy church. And this morning, the grass lots are open. <laughs> it's just, you got to know these things. You gotta, I saw the sign. I was informed. And, uh, you know, in dying churches, the grass lots are closed. But you, you're, in your church, the grass lots are open. Challenge for the grass, but wonderful for you. But, you know, I mean, there's stuff you have to negotiate. You've got, you know, babies. You've got to get to the nursery. And you've got preschoolers. You've got to get somewhere. And, or you tell your wife, you put them somewhere. And, you know, it's just, it, it's, you've got stuff to do. And then just getting ready to get here. Let's be honest, we need the Holy Spirit to minister to us through the elements of Christian worship to draw us into the adoration of Christ. And then this draws us to the Word. Because if what is happening here today is that I preach to you, so what? But if what this is about today is the one true and living God speaking to his people, well, now that means everything. The passage of our consideration found here in John chapter 20 is the third appearance of Jesus after the resurrection according to the Gospel of John. It is, whether you have anticipated it or not, it is the climax of the entire Gospel of John. The verses we just heard are the verses to which 20 chapters of John have been hurtling. And you say, well, why would the climax of the entire Gospel of John, why would, why would the emphatic exclamation point here at the end of John's Gospel why would it be about Thomas? And why would it be about Thomas's doubt? Well, I want to begin this morning by telling you that this passage is not primarily about Thomas. It's certainly not primarily about Thomas's doubt. It is about the sure and certain fact that Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. And it is about the only response that can come from sinful Christians whose lives have been transformed by the gospel, my Lord and my God. I want to read the passage just because I have to. And it is good for us to hear it again. Now Thomas, one of the twelve called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see in his hands the marks of the nails and place my finger in the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, and see my hands, and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. I just want to suggest this morning that I think most of you do not understand this passage. I'm looking at you this morning, you just don't look bright enough. 
No, the point is, as is so often the case in the Gospel of John, there are things revealed here by the Holy Spirit to John, through John, to the church, that are just a lot more shocking than first appear. There's a lot more drama than many people may first see. There are questions asked and answered that are uh, sometimes missed if we are too familiar with the text or look at it too quickly. It begins by saying, now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him. Well, all right. The Gospel of John helps us to understand the building tension that will eventually take Jesus to the cross. Even the opposition that would take Jesus to the cross. Thomas appears by name in John chapter 11. In John chapter 11, this is not exactly a thunderously affirmative way to be introduced to Thomas. Lazarus has died. Jesus is grieving. And of course, as you know, the, the, the account given to us by John of the death of Lazarus, Jesus is not there. And that is the opportunity for Jesus to go to Lazarus and this takes him into the proximity of Jerusalem. And Lazarus, having been dead, he raises to life. And it is one of the most powerful signs or miracles in the Gospel of John by which the identity and the mission of Christ is revealed. The disciples are aware that Jesus is discussing going to Bethany to be with Martha and with Mary who are grieving the death of their brother Lazarus. Verse 12, the disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus has spoken of his death, but they thought he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died. And for your sake, I am glad I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. So Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. This is one of the most pathetic statements of loyalty in all of human history. The opposition to Jesus is already very fierce. The closer you get to the temple, the closer you get to the opposition. Bethany's very close to Jerusalem. Lazarus has died there. Mary and Martha are there. Jesus says, I am going there. And, and Thomas says, well, fine, let's just go with him that we may also die with him. You know, with disciples like this, what kind of church are you going to have? But it's, it's, more, it's more to the point to look to this passage and recognize what Jesus said just before Thomas said what Thomas ingloriously said. Because if you want to see the connection, just to understand, you now can't look at John 11 without knowing John 20. Okay, so follow. Look back at John 11. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus has died, and for your sake I am glad I was not there, so that you may believe, but let us go to him. That's when Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us go, that we may die with him. So what was Jesus saying to the disciples? He was pointing to the fact that they did not clearly understand it yet at the time, that he was going to go and raise Lazarus from the dead. They would witness Lazarus dead, and by the power of God in Christ, through the Son, the Lord of life, and the Lord of death, Lazarus would be raised from the dead, but not just as a spectacular something to see, in order that you may believe. 
So Thomas was there and was actually told, as the other disciples were told, that Jesus is going in order to perform a sign in order that they would believe. You got to keep that in mind. We don't know Thomas until here. Later in the Gospel of John, Jesus will speak about going back to the Father and, and returning to the Father. And Jesus will tell the disciples, where I go, there you shall be also. And Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. And now John chapter 20. So we only know a couple of things about Thomas. None of them incline us towards confidence that he believes. Now we come to John 20, and it is not Lazarus who has been raised from the dead. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who is raised from the dead. And this is not the beginning of this account. This is the third appearance. As you look at John chapter 20, Jesus is raised from the dead, and then he appears to Mary Magdalene. I have seen the Lord. And then he appears to the disciples. And, and this is now eight days later. He appears again with the disciples, most importantly to Thomas. So again, it's the same Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin. Crucial information, he was not with them when Jesus came. This means that second appearance, when Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene first, then he appeared to the disciples later, we're told that Thomas, the disciple, also called the twin, was not there when Jesus appeared. And that is the setup for Thomas saying, well, I don't know about you fellas, but I'm not going to believe unless I can stick my fingers in his wounds and put my hand in his side and know he's raised from the dead, and then I'll believe. You need to classify that statement just like the two previous statements Thomas has made in the Gospel of John. You need to see it especially in light of John chapter 11, where Jesus had already told the disciples that he would raise Lazarus from the dead. Well, actually, what he says is he's going to perform a sign. We know it was raising Lazarus from the dead, and we know that he did raise Lazarus from the dead, and it was, Jesus said, in order that you may believe. And the first thing we hear about Thomas in chapter 20 is that he doesn't believe, and that he is going to set the rules whereby he will believe. This is where we have to track this passage more carefully than you might think because you think some things happened that didn't happen and some things happened that you didn't recognize happened. All right, so let's follow. Now remember, the disciples had borne witness to him in, in verse 23. So the disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, and, and notice the specifics. Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, one. And place my finger into the mark of the nails, number two. And place my hand into his side. Remember, pierced with the spear. I will never believe. I, I, I just want us to pause for a moment and consider that you might have missed the word Never. All right, here's a cardinal rule. Someone should make this into a wonderful praise hymn. Never tell Jesus never. Never tell Jesus never. You might not have noticed that never before, but that never is astounding. It's astounding in light of the entire ministry of Jesus. It's, it's astounding in light of the other disciples. It's astounding in light of John chapter 11 because Jesus said, I'm performing a sign in order that you may believe. He performed the sign. And, and the disciples did not believe, or they didn't believe all that they needed to believe, even for sufficient for their 
Christian understanding. But now the, the other disciples have seen Jesus and Jesus presented himself to them. They believe. Thomas doesn't believe. And Thomas sets the rules where he, whereby he will believe. If these things don't happen, he will never believe. Well, here's something I want to point out. They never happen. And Thomas believes. I think you think they happened. But let's look at the passage. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus answered him as a believer, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. What does the passage not tell us? The passage doesn't tell us that he stuck his finger in the wound. The passage doesn't tell us that he put his hand in Jesus' side. It tells us that Jesus appeared to him and his first response is, my Lord and my God. What we want to learn from John chapter 20 is not just what happened when Thomas saw the risen Christ, we, we want to understand what does saving faith look like? Well, the reason we remember Thomas is because he's not so famous for his faith, but for his doubt. And as, as I've shown, he's kind of been a doubter from the beginning. But this is the climax of the Gospel of John. I mean, so, so Thomas doesn't have a bit part in the Gospel of John. His confession is the quintessential Christian confession of Jesus Christ. He says what has not yet been said by human lips. He doesn't merely say, as you see here, my Lord. He says, my Lord and my God. All right, you're not shocked by that. I want to tell you why you're not shocked by that and why your situation is very different than the situation of Thomas. Why are you not shocked by that? Well, you're not shocked by that because you have the Gospel of John. You're not shocked by that because you have heard this before. You're not shocked by that because John, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, has walked us through all this before. You're not shocked by this because John hit you in the face with this in John chapter 1. Thomas didn't have John chapter 1. John chapter 1 came only after the Holy Spirit gave the early church the New Testament, and in this case the four Gospels, and in this case the Gospel of John, let me tell you what you have, what we have, that Thomas didn't have. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things are made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light comes into the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. You remember that. And then John bears witness to the light. Verse 9, the true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. You know what Thomas didn't know? You know what the other disciples didn't know? They did not know as they were walking talking with Jesus. And when he took the mud and he put it on the blind man's eyes, mixed with some of his spittle, and he gave him his sight, he said, go, go wash and go to the pool of Siloam and wash. And he washed and he came back seeing you know what the disciples didn't know? They didn't know that Jesus made the man. They didn't know that Jesus made the mud. They didn't know that the one who sent this man to go to the pool of Siloam and wash, and he went and he washed and he came back seeing. They did not know 
that this was the creator of the universe, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. You know it because we're told that in the beginning of the Gospel of John. And it's not just that. Look, of course, in the verses you already know. He came into his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory. Glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, there's, there's so much. We just turn chapter by chapter, page by page in the Gospel of John. And we know this, and the disciples did not know this. They didn't know it yet. And and this is explained within the New Testament. There were many things that could not be taught to the church until after the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, there are many things that must be taught to the church that will not come to the church until I have ascended and I am with the Father. And Jesus would say, when the perfect comes, and, 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 and so what we have in the Scripture, I just want to say to you this morning, we have no excuse for being in the position of Thomas. It, we do not have less access to Christ than Thomas had. We have infinitely more access to Christ in terms of knowing who he is. We, we have far less excuse than Thomas for disbelief. for being an unbeliever. But let's go back to Thomas. You know, when you see a passage like this, I have to ask questions I don't hear other people asking. You want to know the strangest question I have from this passage? I think it's it's a question that really grabs my heart about evangelism about preaching, about how the gospel works. It's a chastening question to me about what's really going on in a human heart because you can't see it and I can't see it. And frankly, we don't even know our own hearts with assurance. God does. Here's the question. Why is Thomas there? Seriously, why is Thomas there? If he believes that the crucifixion was the end of the story, why is Thomas there? If Thomas is concerned for his own skin, so much so that when he appears first in John chapter 11, he says, well, let's just go with him that we can die with him. Well, he died. The threat, the bodily threat against the disciples is clear. Far safer to flee into the north to go into the wilderness, to just blend in. But Thomas is there. And not only that, this passage tells us eight days later. Eight days later, Thomas is there. Why is Thomas there? Why is Thomas there to say, I'm not going to believe unless I can stick my finger in his wounds and my hand in his eye? Why why is Thomas there? Well, I have to answer, first of all, the sovereignty of God. There are people who are here I mean, in here, today by the sovereignty of God, and you don't know why you're here. As a matter of fact, given the state of your heart right now, there's no earthly explanation for why you're here. You don't believe what this congregation has been singing. You you, you don't believe the word that has just been Red, you, you, you don't yet believe anything I'm saying in this sermon, but you're here, like Thomas was there. And I just want to tell you, you don't know why you're here. I know why you're here. It's because you are being pursued. It's because the story isn't first about you. Thomas didn't choose Jesus. Jesus chose Thomas. Thomas doesn't even know why he's there. I don't know why he's there. There is no answer to the question why he's there other than Jesus would say, 
Well, you're here for the same reason Lazarus died. So that you can now see a sign and believe. Let me notice something else going on here. Satan invented these headphones. <laughs> this one is like a spider that has been working its way off my head the entire time. Foul demon, go out! There we go. All right. Here we go. <laughs> so, so, how does Jesus address Thomas? Because you know what Thomas said to the other disciples? I'm not going to believe unless, unless, unless. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. And it, it says, although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he speaks to Thomas. Okay, I want to ask you a question. Is Thomas here markedly different than the other disciples? Because the way this passage is broken out, I mean, you would think so, right? I mean, it, I just want to suggest we don't remember this passage as clearly as we ought. So let's go back to when Jesus appeared to the disciples without Thomas. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors were locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. Okay, do you notice it's exactly the same thing? Eight days later, it's exactly the same thing. The door was locked. And Jesus appears in the room. And he says to the disciples, peace be with you. Okay? okay there's something else that's exactly the same. Notice what follows. Jesus said to them again, verse 21, peace be with you. But notice what happens in verse 20. When he had said this the first time, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Okay, let me tell you the way I think we remember this, which is not right. I think we remember John 20 as the disciples without Thomas seeing Jesus and just immediately recognizing him. That's not what happens. It's, it's, it's not what happens. What happened in the second appearing of Jesus is exactly what happened in the third appearing of Jesus, right down to the most minute detail. Jesus showed the other disciples his wounds. And then you'll notice, only then did they recognize it is the Lord. I don't know who else they thought showed up in a locked room. But the point is, Jesus appeared to them in a locked room, didn't pass through the door, said, peace be with you, shows his wounds, and they believe. Okay, so... It's not that the other disciples were just instant recognizers of Jesus. No, they saw the wounds. And then they recognized he was the Lord. But in this third appearance where doubting Thomas is with the other disciples, Jesus clearly knows what Thomas has said. So he singles out Thomas. He said to Thomas, after he said, peace be with you, then he said to Thomas, or in the second appearing, he showed, at that point, his wounds, and they believed, they recognized him. In this case, he singles out Thomas, and then he instructs Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, and put out your hand and place it in my side. So it's the exact sequence of exactly what Thomas said must happen for him to believe. And you know what happened next? Thomas puts his finger there. Thomas looks at Christ's hands. And Thomas put his hand in Jesus' side. I hope you're looking at the text so you know that what I just said isn't there. 
That's not what happened. There's absolutely no evidence in the text that Thomas did any of the things he said he was going to do that had to be met in order for him to believe. Especially the touching, that's just not here. But he saw Christ. But you'll notice that Jesus also, and I said this is the climactic passage in the Gospel of John. And, and again, we miss, we miss how this climax is set up. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands and put your hand out and place it in my side. And then the next words, they're the, some of the strangest words in the New Testament. It's not that we don't understand them. It's, it's, it's just, it's strange grammar. You know, strange grammar ought to get our attention. It's a command. It's a command with a very strange verb tense. It's, it's so strange from the Greek to the English, it, you just lose something. What Jesus says to Thomas is, be not disbelieving, but believing. Be not disbelieving, but believing. Now, it's very hard to translate that into English. And so the best we can do is say something like, do not disbelieve, but believe. But in the verb tense, and I don't normally bring this out I wouldn't unless it's just really important. It is really important just to say this is a present perfect, pluperfect. We're not really sure. I'm not, all I know is in the Greek it is don't be disbelieving, but be believing. And you know, that just doesn't say, you know, turn to someone and say, be believing. Okay, well, be nice, you know. I, but we don't think in that term, but it really does communicate. You think about it and you go, okay, I, I, I do get that. It's not just believe, it's be believing. It's not just that the problem is not being a believer. The problem is not just doubt. The problem is not just disbelief. The problem is you're unbelieving. Don't be unbelieving, be believing. Thomas answered him, my Lord and my God. Again, it is go, going, back, going back to the, to the beginning of the Gospel of John. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld his glory, glories of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. And, the, and then as, as, as this goes through in the, the appearances of Jesus, the conversations with Jesus, the revelations of Jesus, it's all summarized in the most climactic summary confession of faith that the church can muster, which is found here in John chapter 20. And it doesn't come from Peter. It doesn't come from John. It comes from Thomas. We call doubting Thomas. It's Thomas who says, my Lord and my God. It's short. It's right. It's the church's confession. And then comes, then comes a, a beatitude. That's exactly what it is. It's just like the beatitudes found in the Gospel of Matthew from the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus said, blessed be those, blessed be those, blessed be those. That's the beatitude. Blessed. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and have yet believed. Okay, I just, I just want you to think about this. This blessing of Jesus is given to whom? Well, to us. To us. Actually, to virtually every Christian after Thomas, who have come to faith through the proclamation of the gospel, who have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ through someone sharing the gospel with us. We were not in an upper room. Jesus did not appear through a locked door. The gospel came to us by the preaching of the gospel. Again, here's the thing. When Jesus says blessed, is he just saying, oh, you guys are sweet? No, here's the strange thing. Jesus is actually saying we are advantaged over Thomas. Do you feel advantaged over Thomas? 
Believers, I'm speaking to you. Do you feel advantaged over Thomas? Thomas saw the Lord, the risen Christ. His wounds evident. He appeared in a room that was locked. He spoke to Thomas. And we are in a more blessed position than Thomas? And the answer is yes. If all we had that Thomas didn't have was the gospel of John, we are infinitely more blessed. We don't have to connect the dots about Jesus the way the disciples had to connect the dots. They were not, they were hearing conversation by conversation. They were seeing miracle by miracle, or as John would say, sign by sign. They're, 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 they're piecing all this together. And eventually, by the Holy Spirit, they did piece it all together, and they were used by the Holy Spirit many of those disciples actually to be the authors of Scripture as the apostles of the church. And thus, it's John, the disciple who becomes John, the apostle who becomes John, the gospel writer, and thus we have the gospel of John. And John takes us back to the beginning. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word, say it, was God. Okay, that's pretty much what Thomas says. But Thomas doesn't say it until John chapter 20. Now, my assignment was to end at verse 29. But I just want to point that it has to be tied to the verses that follow that are actually the literary conclusion to the Gospel of John. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. I think some of you here don't know why you're here. And I'm confident by the scripture that I know why you're here. I think some of you think, well, the evidence for the deity of Christ, the atoning work of Christ, that was more accessible to the apostles than it was to us. No, it's more accessible to us than it was to them. I want you to see very quickly there are two kinds of doubt. And I, I want you to even consider your own heart, all of us as believers and some here who, again, you don't know why you're here. And I said, I do know why you're here. It's because there are really two forms of disbelief. There are even two forms of doubt. There's the doubt that doesn't want to believe. And there's the doubt that does want to to believe. I think the doubt that does want to believe is a sign of the Holy Spirit working within the human heart to call that sinner to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We can talk about doubt and its role in the Christian faith. I actually don't think this is the best passage to look at for that. I don't think it's even right to call Thomas doubting Thomas. Not the way it ends. My Lord and my God. There's not an atom or molecule of doubt there. I do think it's fair to see Thomas as someone who didn't believe until he did. But then again, that's the Christian story. I just want to speak to those who are believers this morning and say, let's exult in the gospel. Let's exult in the fact that Jesus Christ is our Lord and our God. Not only the crucified, but the resurrected and ascended Lord coming in glory. As believers, let's remember that around us, there are disbelievers in whom the Holy Spirit is already at work bringing them to Christ. And they need to hear from you the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ because you do not know what is happening when you speak of Christ and testify of Christ and your experience of coming to faith in Christ and, and your confidence in Christ. You don't even know what the Lord is doing with that. 
And to those of you who are not yet believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, I just want to say that you are not in front of a television screen eating Cheetos in your flip-flops this morning. For a reason you may not even discern in your own heart. And I want to tell you what that reason is. You want to believe, and the Holy Spirit is drawing you to Christ. And for you this morning, in this proclamation of this passage, this is your opportunity to see the Lord and to say, my Lord and my God. We pray to see God's glory as the saints are edified and sinners are called to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ right now. Let's pray together. Father, we're just so thankful for this passage and all you've given us in John chapter 20. Father, for, thank you for opening our eyes to see. And Father, we know our eyes are blessed. We know we are infinitely blessed by the gospel that has come to us by which we are saved. Father, we pray to see your mercy and grace and wooing love at work right now. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.